For three decades this case sat cold. But modern developments in DNA technology would lead police down the darkest of rabbit holes, where they would come face to face with a monster more depraved than they could possibly ever have conceived. Hello and welcome to the little shop of crime, curators and purveyors of all things macabre and mysterious. Starting to wish I hadn't picked such a long opening line now. And macabre doesn't even cut it for today's story. I have to warn you that this is perhaps the darkest case I'm ever going to cover. It's so disturbing that I was in two minds about even covering it at all. But before we get into it, I'm Steve and I offer interesting and unusual true crime cases weekly. So if that's your thing, please don't forget to subscribe. And any case suggestions, drop them in the comments below or check the description for other ways you can get in touch. Okay, let's investigate. This is The Morgue Monster, David Fuller. Today's case takes us back in time, back to the 1980s, where spandex was the only clothing sold, hair was at its all-time largest, and you couldn't move for neon. But as much as I wish we were heading to Miami, the events of today's case take us back to Blighty, and to the quintessentially British town of Royal Tunbridge Wells. Located in the affluent county of Kent, less than 30 miles southeast of central London, Tunbridge Wells is a small, leafy town with a population just over 50,000. And it's as quiet as it is picturesque. That's why the events of today's case caused such a stir. The events of this case take us all the way back to June 22nd, 1987, and to Guildford Road, where 25-year-old Wendy Nell lived alone in her bedsit, which is basically a very small, one-room apartment. She left her work at around 5pm and spent the evening at her boyfriend Ian's house, before he dropped her home right here at 11pm, unaware that it would be the last time he saw her alive. The following day, Ian received a call from Wendy's colleagues because she hadn't shown up for work that day and wasn't answering her phone. Ian went straight over to check on her and made the awful discovery. The body of Wendy, naked and covered in blood. She'd been sexually assaulted, brutally beaten and strangled. Investigators believe her killer entered the property through a faulty back window because there was no signs of forced entry. And there he waited for Wendy to come home. Forensics teams did find a partial shoe print on Wendy's blouse, which they managed to correspond with a specific type of running shoe, a Clark's Sports Trek. A fingerprint was also found on a plastic bag, but other than that, there were no real leads at the time. News of Wendy's murder spread fast around the small town, as its residents feared the killer might strike again. And these fears came true some five months later, on the 24th of November, when 20-year-old Carolyn Pierce was abducted from outside her basement bedsit on Grosvenor Park, less than a mile away from Wendy's. She was last seen at about midnight, when a taxi driver dropped her home after a night out with friends. Neighbours reported hearing screams coming from Caroline's bedsit shortly after midnight and her house was found empty the following day. An extensive search in the area surrounding her house led to nothing, and sadly three weeks would pass before Caroline's body was found by a farmer in a remote location near Romney Marsh more than 40 miles away. Police recovered her body from a drainage ditch. She too was naked, having been sent assaulted, beaten and strangled. It didn't take long for police to connect the two murders. The MO was strikingly similar. Both were found nude after being violated and strangled, and both had distinctive key rings removed and kept as a macabre souvenir. They also worked as shop assistants on the same high street and lived less than a mile apart. And not only that, there were reports of 
prowler activity in the lead up to their deaths with reports of a voyeur peering in through their windows. Police now knew they had a serial killer on their hands, and the brutal nature of the crimes gained national attention. But the crimes the media were now referring to as the bedsit murders would gradually grow colder. As leads were exhausted and police were no closer to unearthing the double murderer, and no doubt the perpetrator started to think they had got away with it. And 34 long years passed with no answers, but detective never gave up. They had DNA samples taken from both victims, and so the case was revisited every time enhancements were made to DNA analysis. And in 1999, detectives announced that they had managed to obtain a full DNA profile for Wendy's killer. But the major breakthrough came in 2019, when new developments allowed forensics teams to check for profiles of people who might be related to the killer and checks on the national database linked the crime to a potential list of 1,000 names, which was reduced to 90 priority names. The police were closing in. Allow me to introduce you to Mr. David Fuller. A 66-year-old father of three, David is just your typical boring old guy with boringly normal hobbies, like bird-watching, cycling, photography, and, oh yeah, brutal murder. Yes, beneath the veneer of a humdrum old man life hid a monster of unfathomable depravity. Hello. Morning. Oh, David's oh. place. Hello. Joe needs to come and speak to you. Oh, yes, come. Are you here alone? David, if you listen to what I'm going to say, yes. Just, um, we're from Kent Police and we're investigating the murders of Wendy Nell and Caroline Pierce in 1987. Okay. As part of that investigation, you've been linked as a suspect, both geographically and forensically. Okay, if you listen to what my colleague's going to say to you. All right, David, you're under arrest on suspicion of the murders of Wendy Nell and Caroline Pierce in 1987. Do you understand? Yes. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention, when questioned, something which you later on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. You are being arrested to secure and preserve evidence by means of questioning. So we can conduct searches, so forensic samples can be obtained and to prevent your disappearance. Do you understand? And so David Fuller was arrested at his home in Heathfield, East Sussex, which is 14 miles south of Tunbridge Wells. Initially, Fuller denied knowing either of the girls, and he claimed he was not familiar with the Tunbridge Wells area at all. But his DNA linked him to both crimes with a billion to one certainty, and his fingerprint was matched to the one found in Wendy's bedsit. Not only that, but remember the shoe print? Well, police conducted an extensive search of his home and found a number of photographs of Fuller in the 1980s wearing the exact same shoes. They also found a receipt from Buster Brown's, which was an American diner where Caroline worked. And they found Super Snap's camera film sleeves from where, you guessed it, Wendy worked at the time. On top of this, Fuller was a member of a cycling club back then, and the route they frequently rode took them right past Romney Marsh, where Caroline's body was discovered. Investigators now thought it was highly likely that Fuller met both victims before he killed them. It was likely he had selected them and stalked them beforehand. They also found diary entries of 30 Prowler-like burglaries he'd committed at the time. And as if that wasn't enough, it turned out he actually lived on Guildford Road, the same road where Wendy lived and was found dead at the time of her murder. And this is where things take a sudden and unexpected turn. So strap in. Evidence that linked Fuller to the bedsit murders was not all police found when they searched his home. They also found a disturbing collection of indecent and illegal images, videos and accounts of abuse on handwritten diaries going back to the 1980s. Mobile phones from the 1990s, more than 100 hard drives, 2,200 floppy disks, 30 SIM cards, 1,300 CDs and DVDs, 34,000 physical photographs, negative slides and camera rolls. This is the evidence room containing all of the seized items relating to this case. 
Altogether, police seized more than 14 million indecent images that he... Wait, what? 14 million? Even if he looked at one picture every single second and didn't get a wink of sleep, it would take him more than 162 days to look at all of them. And that's before he even got to the videos. But he didn't stop there. There's some stuff stuck on the back of that one as well. I've got the body worn on it, literally as it's happened. Well, on the back of his oh. chest of drawers, it looks like he's got some hard drives in there, I would say. Oh. But they're stuck to the back oh. of the chest of drawers. Yeah, it's a sand disc one that I can read there. Shortly after his arrest, Nevrez Kamal grabbed a kitchen knife and ran to Collindale Police Station, where Fuller was being held. Police apprehended her and she was kept in a cell for 34 hours for her own safety. She went there with the sole intention of killing David Fuller. And frankly, I don't blame her. She had just been told that David Fuller had violated the body of her daughter, Azra shortly after she died from injuries sustained after she accidentally fell from a bridge. Footage of him assaulting her was found on the hard drive strapped to the back of a cabinet hidden inside a closet, and she was one of hundreds. These secret hard drives were packed with images and videos of David Fuller violating dead bodies in the morgue within Tunbridge Wells Hospital, where he worked as a handyman. It was always in the evenings, David. It was always evening time. Yes. Yeah. Can you tell me what you've been doing? Can you try and explain it to me? No. I, I find it hard. Yes. I want to admit that I am admitting the offences, but I don't really want to go into detail. And what offences are you admitting, David? As you've just described to me. OK. In terms of the... Sexual penetration of yep. corpses. Okay. And do you, do you know how many occasions, David? No. No. Have, have you been recording yourself doing those things? Recording yourself sexually penetrating the corpses? I admit that, that Yeah. David Fuller admitted to assaulting at least 80 bodies in the three decades he worked at the hospital, with ages ranging from 9 to a 100-year-old woman, and that accounts for just the ones he filmed and photographed between 2008 and 2020. He'd been working there since 1989, so detectives suspect there are hundreds more victims. Fuller had a swipe card that gave access to virtually anywhere in the hospital, including the post-mortem room, where he would sometimes be required to perform maintenance on the refrigerators, and where he carried out all of his heinous attacks. CCTV from the mortuary area shows that when he was on camera, he'd carry items or perform actions that appeared legitimate. The five mortuary staff members worked until 4pm. As Fuller's shift ended at 7pm, that gave him a three-hour uninterrupted window every time he worked. Fuller would enter the post-mortem area via utility rooms that offered no surveillance. Once there, he could access the fridges and the bodies without anybody knowing. The post-mortem area was not covered by cameras, which is usual practice in order to protect the dignity of the dead. Fuller admitted that afterwards he'd look up his victims on Facebook, and he'd browse their galleries and read the messages from grieving loved ones. Following the discovery of his crimes and their magnitude, Operation Sandpiper was launched, with the aim of identifying as many of his victims as possible, and offering dozens of specially trained liaison officers to help families come to terms with what he did. So far costing over £2.5 million, police have sifted through 150,000 hours of CCTV footage in order to piece together Fuller's movements, and it took high-powered computers over 10 months to sort through his sea of depravity. They used systems that were ordinarily used to identify victims of large-scale disasters. And so far, 82 out of 101 recorded victims have been identified. But sadly, the names of some will never be known, due to a lack of distinguishing features like scars, marks, or tattoos.
David Fuller appeared before Maidstone Crown Court on Wednesday, December 15th, 2021, where he admitted to the assaults but denied the murders based on a defence of diminished responsibility. Then, shockingly, on November 4th, the now 67-year-old changed his plea to guilty. Wendy was described in court as successful, happy and independent. For her murder, Fuller received a whole life tariff. Caroline was described in court as a lively young woman finding her place in the world. For her murder, Fuller received a second whole life tariff. The judge added this was a premeditated killing, carefully planned and executed. Detective Chief Superintendent Paul Fotheringham added, David Fuller is responsible for a level of offending of unimaginable horror and depravity. He has targeted and brutally murdered two young women in the prime of their lives, seemingly for no other reason than to satisfy his own warped desires and force the families and friends of Wendy and Caroline to endure more than three decades of incomprehensible suffering. His abhorrent offending has also caused suffering and inconceivable trauma to the lives of hundreds of other people, many of whom were still grieving the loss of loved ones. David Fuller showed nothing but self-pity throughout the entire trial and aftermath. He will spend the rest of his miserable life behind bars. What's perhaps most shocking though is that despite him receiving two whole life tariffs for the murders, the mortuary abuse only amounted to a total of 12 years. I feel like it's my duty to remain impartial and diplomatic and just give you the facts. But a case as abhorrent as this makes me realise that monsters do exist. David Fuller is evil personified and this is the worst case I've ever had the displeasure of researching. I know it was a dark case but if you've learned something please give this video a quick like for me and subscribe so you don't miss next week's case which thankfully takes us somewhere a little more exotic and has a slightly happier ending. See you then. Bye.